we're still living in the time and there were studies made that people need to be fearful societies that fear punishment have a lot lower crime level than societies that are you know that have a conscious so the conscious societies are not doing as well as the societies that are fearful can you uh, please explain why fear is a great motivator <laughs> no question about it and if you want to run a company or you want to run a school or you want to run a government fear is very necessary and very effective but that's because it's not a relationship have a relationship with the government. So if the government has strict rules, that's fine. Nothing wrong with nothing missing. Of course, if you overdo it, you become murderous. But the mitzvahs of Torah, that's our relationship with God. So to simply say, do it out of fear, what kind of relationship is that? That's why doing it for the reward or the punishment is, is offensive. A man is good to his wife because he's afraid of her. What kind of relationship is that? So that's why Rambam is saying, if you think that this is all a, a way of achieving award and, and avoiding punishment, you're not in the relationship. One other thing, what exactly is the punishment in, in the Torah? Equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? It means that if you lean too far to the left, the punishment will be that you will lean very far to the right. That brings back the balance. Because you were very far to the left, if you lean very far to the right, you end up in the middle. So the Rambam says, when a person sins, he should go in the opposite extreme, and that will bring him back to the center. Which means, every punishment is really a corrective measure. There's no revenge. There's no, you hurt me, I'll hurt you. That's not God. If you cause damage, since he is your father, he will come and clean up the damage. Like, like parents who diaper a baby. You mess up, the parents clean up. Now, cleaning up might be uncomfortable to the child. Doesn't like being bathed in hot water. Here's, listen, listen to this little uh, example. A father says to his son, you're running around barefoot, it's dangerous. The kid says, nah. The father says, you'll get a splinter. He says, so what, uh, big deal. He says, no, no, a splinter can get infected. So, well, if it gets infected, it can become gangrene. You, 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 you might you might lose a leg. It says that. Nah. He runs without shoes. He gets a splinter. It becomes gangrene. They take him to the hospital, and the doctor comes with these sharp, cold, steel tools and digs out the infection, and it's painful. But he saves the leg. Now the kid is all recovered. He's all, and he's running around barefoot. And the father says to him, that's dangerous. Nah, you'll get a splinter, big deal. He said, well, you'll get infected. So what? Uh, but then we'll have to go to the hospital and get it fixed. Oh, he goes and he puts on shoes. <laughs> now, what just happened here? The father says to him, running around barefoot is gonna cause damage. It's dangerous. It's risky. The kid says, no, I don't care. The father says, if it does happen, the doctor will be able to save your foot. Oh, that's scary. So he goes and he puts on shoes. 
So he's not afraid of causing damage, he's afraid of the cure. That is so immature. The cure scares you. So every punishment that God gives, including hell and Gehenna, it's all a cleansing process. It's all the healing. So you say, well, I don't mind creating damage and ruining everything, but oh, that's what it takes to clean up? Okay, I won't do it. You're more afraid of the cure than you are of the damage. See, that's childish. And that's part of why Rambam says, if you're doing it because you want to avoid the punishment, you've got everything backwards. The sin is wrong, not the punishment. It's so, it's so mature. Rabbi Friedman, I know you started by saying that we should never want um, punishment upon anybody. However, there's so much wrong in the world today, and we see the people who are doing wrong to the world and to other people, and um, and I guess um, a lot of us are not as holy, <laughs> who kind of do want to see justice happen and see those people um, pretty much, well, at least stopped, and the only way I guess they possibly can be stopped if something, if they're stopped in a harsh way, because it doesn't seem like um, uh, anything else will work at this point. So as a citizen of the state, yeah, <laughs> jail, jail time, prison seems to be the answer. But as Jews, concerned with God's plan, we don't want jail. We want the people to recognize the wrongness of what they're doing, suffer terrible embarrassment, if that you know, can be considered punishment, and correct themselves and become as good as they were bad, which would make them very good. <laughs> Robert Friedman, are we as a society ready to be conscious and not worry about punishment? Because your mantra is positivity and kindness. And um, I think for some people it's amazing. And um, what would you say to those people who say that positivity and kindness uh, can relax people too much and they can become you know, not their best. It may be a reflection of their own thinking. They know what works for them and they're assuming that the same would work for everybody. Uh, there are also people who feel like education is not the solution. Don't educate, just punish. We don't believe that. We can't believe that. There are individuals, maybe, who can't be reasoned with, who can't tap into the goodness, the kindness, the, no, the, the, the nobility, the ideals. Most human beings are not like that. Most human beings respond to what makes sense, to what sounds decent, to what is noble, so why cater to the minority, to the lowest denomination, when you can educate the majority of people in a positive way? So yes, education changes people. I mean, a good education, not liberal arts. <laughs> and the beauty of, of a mitzvah will motivate most people. Don't, don't, don't condemn human beings as being animals and incorrigible. It's not true and it's not nice. Well, every, every law book sounds harsh. That's what a law book is. Now, tampering with, what, is, what do they say on the airline? Tampering with the smoke detector in the in the in the bathroom 
is punishable by such and such and such. Sounds pretty harsh. You're going to go to jail. But that's a law. That's how you present laws. Then there are the amendments. The amendments soften the law, always. They don't always apply. It's only under these circumstances, only if you can afford it, you know, like that. So if you read only the written Torah, you do come away with an impression that we're all going to die. <laughs> we're, we're all sinners. We, we, we're doomed. But once you read the oral Torah, the, the, um, the explanations that God gave to Moshe, then you realize that they're not as harsh as they sound. In fact, Moshe himself did that. Um, at the end of 40 years in the desert, Moshe says to the people, let's gather, gather around, I want to talk to you. Look at you all standing here alive and well in the presence of God. What he was saying was, you may have gotten the impression that the laws are so strict and the laws are so dangerous that there's no chance. None of you are going to survive. You're all going to be dead. That's right from the time of the giving of the Torah. Now it's 40 years later. You know how much you've sinned and let yet look, you're all here, healthy, alive. So you got the wrong impression. Torah is not out to kill you. <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, but in all fairness, not all were, were well and alive. Some were punished by death. That was the exception. So if, if we, uh, Christianity is limited to the scripture. And that's very, sounds very harsh. So it was almost like they had no choice but to say, and the laws were canceled. The laws don't apply anymore. Otherwise, we're all going to be dead. That's because they didn't have the oral Torah that uh, fills in the picture. So the mitzvahs don't have to be canceled or they don't have to be discontinued. And we're not all going to suffer. Rabbi Friedman, but in all fairness, uh, we were, we have this ninth of Av every year, which commemorates the fact that those who, um, that the men who God told were not going to enter the land of Israel didn't, that a certain amount of men had to die. There was a punishment, punishment for the sin of the spies. Well, the punishment was not death. The punishment was not going into the land, but they died natural deaths over the 40 years that they were in the desert. Even, even the destruction of the temple, first and second, that happened on Tisha B'Av, the people were guilty of sins that are punishable by death. So God said, I'm not going to kill them all. I'll destroy the temple instead. So even the destruction of the temple shows that you don't know how the sin is going to be corrected. You don't know how people are going to be punished or rewarded. So we shouldn't guess or assume that there's going to be death and there's going to be plagues and there's going to, you don't know. By the way, concerning the fast of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the fast is meant to be a form of grieving, not sadness. They're easily confused, but they're not the same at all. Grief is a holy thing. Sadness is unholy. Grief is a feeling of intense life. Sadness is no feelings at all, very different. So we have to be careful. Tisha B'Av is not a time for sadness. 
sadness can be very self-centered, indulgent. I'm in a bad mood, so I love Tisha B'Av. No, it's not, it's not there for your bad mood. Either you're grieving the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem, the loss of, of the temples, or, 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 or don't be sad. So grieve or don't grieve, but sadness is not, is not acceptable ever, not even on Tisha B'Av. And too many people identify Tisha B'Av as a sad time. Not good. Speaking of good news, there's a wonderful retreat coming up, the National Jewish Retreat, run by the JLI, Jewish Learning Institute, it's going to be August 9th through the 14th in the Miami area, in a five-star hotel, best speakers, best lectures, best classes, best accommodations, and best food. So if you have those five days free, or any one of those five days free, think about joining us. It's going to be great for body and soul. And there's actually a discount if you put my initials in there, RMF, is a little discount for those who are already committed, already studying, already interested. Google it, look it up, Jewish Retreat, JLI. And uh, hopefully we'll see you there. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. I want to invite you to join us as VIPs, partners in our work, and join us also for uh, a personal chat with other members of the VIP club. We talk about many things, there's an opportunity to ask, to respond, to make a comment, to meet the other supporters. And together we can really make a difference in Jewish life and in life in general. So join us. It's goodtoknow.org. Log in, call, make contact, and join us with the VIPs.